Um, hi, I'm Bart Massey. Um, I'm currently, for the past n years, a professor at Portland State University. Uh, I've been an open source developer, depending on how you count that term, for about 30, 35 years. So um, I like building stuff and giving it away. Um, half of you know me. The other half, I'm looking forward to getting to know. So yeah. Um, and uh, you know, the talk today is more in the nature of a brain dump than anything else. Um, I sort of picked a couple of topics and a bunch of topics in sort of a haphazard fashion. There must be some word for that, I guess. Um, but uh, but um, should be a very interactive thing. I really would rather talk with you than at you. Um, I'm fully capable of giving an hour and 45 minutes of lecture mode lecture, and then you'll fall asleep, and I'll be bored too, and probably nobody will learn anything. So don't save your questions to the end or comments to the end, please. That's my job is to direct traffic. You let me know as you think of things. Uh, I want to tackle a topic. To be honest, I picked up the abstract a week or two ago that I'd submitted to Open Source Bridge on the topic of random and looked at it and started trying to build slides for the all the things I'd promised to do in the abstract and kind of went, oh no. Because <laughs> <laughs> I promised a lot of things. I really kind of wish I'd promised about half as many things. And so, I mean, there's a lot of material here that we're going to cover really, really fast. So slow me down for the parts you're interested in and we'll concentrate on those. And if we don't get to everything, well, we don't get to everything. This is a big, big, big topic. And the more you look at it, the bigger it gets. So, all good? Yay, okay. So, yeah, I want to talk to you today about randomness, which is one of these cool topics that sort of can span everything from the super ultra technical detail stuff all the way to sort of very philosophical, interesting stuff to think about that doesn't have any technical to it at all. Um, it's a concept that we're all kind of used to in the tech community. We're like, oh, sure, you know, random. That, we know what that is. We know how it works. We know what it does. But it's a weird concept. It's such a weird concept that we never even really formalized it until the 16 or 1700s in any way at all. People didn't think about the universe this way. This is a really powerful model to think about things happening by chance or at random. And to make that right turns out to be really really hard and we're still not sure we've got it. I mean, the first thing I should warn you about random is you think you understand it. I think nobody understands it very well. It's a weird idea that sort of things happen sometimes. I mean, especially for us, right? We're computer people. We live in a very clockwork universe. We've got these deterministic machines where if you do everything exactly the same way, we build a ton of hardware to make sure that if you do everything exactly the same way, you get exactly the same outcome every time. That was cool. Yay, that makes things possible to debug. Not easy, maybe, but possible, at least. Um, and it makes it so that when you tell the computer to do something and are successful, then you can repeat that success. In the real world, you know, we know that you do exactly the same thing, and a lot of times, different things happen. Oh, I don't understand. You know, I've done this 100 times before, but this time, something happened, right? And uh, you know, like I said, it's pretty new, the idea that we can even get away with saying, well, that's a thing. We should think about it carefully. Um, Newton, you know, did this really cool formalization of all of physics, right, where it was a clockwork universe. In principle, you could know where every one of these little billiard ball atoms was and how it was moving, and you could sort of deterministically project the universe forward. And you know, if you set everything up the same way or if you knew exactly how things were going to behave, you could predict it. There was no randomness in this model. And we rapidly, post-Newton, found out that that was sort of a flawed model. That the universe doesn't actually work like that. Concurrently, or a little earlier, people like the famous uh, last theorem mathematician Fermat and uh, Blaise Pascal, the philosopher mathematician, started thinking about things like dice and how dice work and how they go together. And they started trying to sort of get some mathematics behind the idea that, well, yeah, if you roll a die, you know, 
you have a one in six chance of getting each of the six numbers. Okay, well, let's formalize that somehow. And then let's ask about the consequences if I roll two dice and add them up. Because, you know, certainly the, the um, 28 possible die rolls or whatever they are don't occur with equal likelihood. And so something really, you know, sums don't occur with equal likelihood. I guess the 10 possible sums don't occur with equal likelihood. And so now what are we, how are we going to figure that out? How are we going to do the math? And so the mathematicians of that era built the beginnings of a pretty good empirical framework that if you gave a probability problem, you could sort of do the math and find out you know, what the odds were. And it was all really phrased in terms of gambling odds because these people were inveterate gamblers, a lot of them. Um, and, but you know, the applications outside of gambling weren't thought about very much. Um, Kolmogorov, the famous Russian mathematician, was the first one to try to sort of nail down a definition of what probability even is, and it turns out to be surprisingly hard. And his definition, which is the one we still use today, isn't even so much about uh, understanding anything. It's what we call an axiomatic definition, meaning I'm just going to define it this way, and if we do that, everything seems to work out all right, but it doesn't give you much insight. In particular, Kolmogorov's definition is all about um, the, the size of descriptions of things being the same as the size of things themselves. It's a really strange axiomatization that when you look at it, you're like, well, I don't understand at first why that should even work. And so, you know, there's this amazing philosophical thread that sort of is worth following that goes from, you know, like I say, the 1600s to the present day of people trying to get their heads around what it even means for something to be random, what it even means to compute a probability, how this stuff should all be thought about. Uh, I'm not going to beat that to death because we're in a room full of technically inclined people, and so I'm going to head down the technology scale pretty fast, if that makes sense. But it, we should start with that. Like I say, um, you know, the fact that a computer is deterministic is going to be a thorn in our side a little bit as we start to talk about randomness. Because, you know, computers sort of can't inherently be random. We, we, we sort of, like I say, went to a lot of trouble to beat that out of them. Anytime a computer is behaving randomly, the hardware engineers are like, darn, it's behaving randomly. How do we fix that? That's the first question they ask. Um, the, when Deep Blue and Kasparov played back, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago now, in their big match the, where uh, Deep Blue beat Kasparov, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> at the end of the game, Kasparov accused the Deep Blue team of cheating. They had a grandmaster, Berliner, on their team. And he said, oh, Berliner was feeding the machine moves. Oh, no, 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 that wasn't happening. And uh, Kasparov said, being a smart guy, said, well, you know, okay, well then, Let's replay the game with the same moves from the same, you know, I'll, I'll make the same moves again and let me see that the computer makes the same moves with everybody out of the room and under controlled conditions. Oh, we can't do that. Why can't you do that? Well, because, you know, we have all these parallel processors and sometimes the finishing times are a little different and the memory allocations are a little different. So the computer won't make the same set of moves the second time. Kasparov's like, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was one of those things where it's like a really embarrassing moment for the hardware software guys. They're like, dang, man, maybe we should have made that deterministic. Today, we're going to try to make machines be random. And so, you know, I want you to, we're going to start thinking about a series of questions. First of all, what do we mean by random? And not in this philosophical sense I was just talking about, but what do we mean by random in the sense of, you know, what is a random thing and how do I know when I have one? which is going to turn out to be a question that actually takes a few minutes. And then we're going to talk about sort of how to make computers be random, which, given everything I just said, is an interesting question, I think. We're going to talk about getting randomness from the outside world, harvesting randomness of various kinds. Um, and then, you know, we'll address at least a little bit, okay, you've got some random now, who cares? Why, why did you want that in the first place and what can we do with it? So that's sort of the general outline of the talk, if you want one of those. All good? 
Everybody's very quiet. I know it's morning. I know that until recently, for me, this would have been the crack of dawn. So, um, so you know, hopefully we can, you know, don't be shy. If you have a question, stop and ask. And, you know, I'm a big poker player. I'm not a good poker player necessarily, but I like it a lot. I play all the time. Um, and, you know, there's a million web-based poker servers, but one of my long stack projects that I'll probably never get to is to build my own. And a lot of the reason why I want to build my own is that, um, look, let's be blunt about this. The poker servers out there, the, there's two kinds. There's the for money ones, and I think anybody who plays poker for money over the internet is either cheating or insane. Um, <laughs> but, and then there's the free ones, which are the kind I like because I like to just practice my game on those. The free ones all cheat. And what I mean by cheat is something a little subtle here. And I say all, but let's just say all the ones I've tried. Um, they don't give you random distributions of hands. And they do that on purpose for the most part because they want a lot of exciting hands. And it turns out that if you deal more aces and you know, face cards than you should, if you deal more suited hands than you should, then there's more exciting hands. And so hopefully that brings people back to your side. Of course, it drives people like me who actually want to practice my poker game completely stone nuts. And so I want to build a poker server that does fair shuffling. And again, if I was going to build my poker server so people could play for money, I better do fair shuffling or I could be in big legal trouble, um, as well as big financial trouble, both kinds of trouble. Um, and it's not enough for me to do that, to make sure that I've got it shuffling right. You have to believe that I've got it shuffling right. right? If I, I've written complaint letters to these poker sites saying, hey, look, here's a distribution of hands. Do you want me to help you make this flat? And they're all like, oh, no, 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 we're certified. We know we're doing the right thing. No, you're not doing the right thing. <laughs> I want to be able to convince you. Um, one way, you know, one obvious, Captain Obvious way, to sort of get fair shuffles, or at least fair enough shuffles that everybody would be happy with them. I, t I, I was saying to my family the other day on Father's Day, I need to get myself a deck of giant cards that I can use when I'm giving talks. And then I opened my Father's Day present, and my boy had ordered me a giant deck of cards with <laughs> custom backs. It's like, ooh, that's cool. <laughs> um, so hopefully everybody in the back can read these giant cards. My vision isn't very good, so I'm happy to have them anyway. Um, you know, and if I take this deck, which right now is all stacked up in a fairly predictable way, and I do this a bunch of times, then, you know, we believe in our heart of hearts that, you know, this is what's called shuffled, that, that I get a random stack of cards. Um, it turns out that's, you know, to change that from a belief into some kind of provable statement is a little tricky, and about 20 years ago now, the mathematician and uh, magician Percy Diaconis proved a nice theorem that said if you do three overhand shuffles and four riffle shuffles on a deck, um, you end up with a deck that's sort of indistinguishable under some assumptions about shuffling from a random deck, a truly shuffled deck. I liked this theorem because the newspapers all reported it the same way, and it just made my head spin because I didn't—I'd never seen the original paper. They said shuffling a deck more than seven times makes it less random, <laughs> which was fascinating to me. Really, really? And so then I went and found the paper. I'm like, oh, it's this other thing. So the point is that you know now this deck is supposed to be random because Percy Diaconus promised me it was, and. <laughs> If I go through it, I do in fact see that, you know, sort of the cards don't have any obvious pattern. Maybe that's what we mean by random. Um, I could build a machine or hire, I guess I could really hire people, right? I could put this all on a, on a, yeah, Mechanical Turk, thank you. And uh, pay people to shuffle decks for me. I'd have to trust them somehow, so I don't know what I'm doing there. And then I could use those decks in my game, but obviously that's kind of expensive. It's got its own set of reliability issues, and, uh, and it's slow. You know, if I want to deal a thousand hands a second, probably even the Mechanical Turk's going to have a hard time keeping up with me on this one. So, uh, so I need to do better than that. 
in a bunch of dimensions. And that's going to be sort of the running example we're going to talk about today. So let's start a little bit with the first thing I promised, which is what do we mean by random? When I say I'm going to be random, what the frick am I even talking about? And you know, sort of the obvious thing to say is, well, you know, we'll say something's uniform random if it's chosen with equal likelihood from all the possible values you could choose. So you know, I, picking a card randomly from the deck means that you know, sort of whatever card I pick had the same likelihood of being chosen as all the other cards that weren't in the deck. That's kind of an okay definition. Um, it works okay. By the way, one consequence of that is that if you ever see on the internet, and you will, somebody telling you to pick a random integer, then you know they don't really understand random very well. Because if you pick a random integer, how big is it going to be? Yeah, bigger than that. Whatever you say, I'm going to say no bigger than that, right? It's an average over an infinite set. You probably can't, you know, on average, it's going to be infinitely large. Oh, OK, that's not very useful. Um, but you can sort of pack, pick a random real number in the range 0 to 1. That's a perfectly sensible thing to say. So not all infinite sets have this problem. It's just unbounded sets. Um, the problem with this definition is it's kind of not testable by itself. Right? If, if I just pick a card and hold it up for you, you know, and I claim, oh, this was a randomly selected card, you've got to take my word for it. Right? There's no knowing. I could have, you know, if, I'd, if I'd cut the deck in such a way that every time I got the same three of hearts, right, you'd be like, oh, mm, that isn't random. But there's no way to tell if I only show it to you once. Why do you think ma magicians never repeat their tricks? It's because of that. Right? <laughs> and so, we really want to think more, not about individual numbers, but when we're looking at things, we really want to think about uniform random sequences. We want to think about numbers one after the other, if that makes sense. And so, you know, if we look at cards, if we look at playing cards, you know, if you look at the ace, two, three, four, five, six of spades, could that be a random sequence? Oh, sure, right? It's possible. But based on what we know about how cards work, it's pretty surprising that that sequence would be chosen out of all the possible sequences. We, we're sort of, you know, if you're a Bayesian, you're like, oh, the priors are all wrong here. That's not random. Or there's very little likelihood. And even if I just, you know, if I vary it between hearts and spades, it still doesn't look like a very random sequence, right? If I um, pick the cards randomly but keep the suit the same, well, that looks more random. But still, why are they all spades, right? What are the odds that it's going to be all spades. They're really, really low, right? If you sit there and compute it, it's one fourth to the fifth, only worse than that because you're pulling spades out all the time. So um, that's one in two to the tenth, which is, you know, one in 1024, which is, you know, what are the odds, right? <laughs> um, and so, well, multiply that by four, though, because maybe it would have all come out hearts. There again, right? These definitions get fiddly, right? Um, you know, when you say, what are the odds? Well, you have to say the odds over what, right? What are the odds that it's suited? What are the odds that it's suited and uh, king high, right? I mean, what question are you asking? Depending on the question you ask, the odds are different. Um, but on the other hand, I think we can all agree that if you just look at this thing, you're like, eh, yeah, that's probably random. It's a little suspicious that there are no repeats in it, but that's possible with 5 out of 13 cards. Maybe that's random. The Kolmogorov description I was describing earlier gives you a different way to look at random. Um, information theory says that a sequence is random, that random sequences sort of out of all possible sequences contain maximal information. What do we mean by that? We mean that if you have a random series, um, you can't really describe it by any better description than, well, here's the series I saw. If I have a non-random series, that first series, right, I can describe very compactly. It's the ace through six of spades, right? Not much information there, right? Um, that last series, I pretty much have to tell you, well, that's the four, seven, nine, king, three, and two of spades, hearts, hearts, clubs, diamonds, hearts, in that order, right? More information. And so, paradoxically, the more random your sequence is, the more information it contains. That seems completely backwards. But it's the only way to make sense of what's actually going on. And so we're looking for these complicated sequences to come out most of the time. 
By the way, the standard for that kind of analysis that we were just talking about is a set of tools by Marsaglia known as the diehard tests. You can find them and use them, and you should if you're playing with randomness at all. Um, they're essentially, I, I phrased this bullet point pretty carefully. They're the gold standard for checking that things that are supposed to be random seem to be random, right? <laughs> you can't, by definition, you sort of can't test for randomness because things of arbitrary low probability can happen. But if your thing fails the diehard test and it was supposed to be random, you can be pretty sure that it's broken somehow. And so think of this as sort of a post-test, as sort of a checker for your randomness to make sure that it's all good. Maybe a better way to think of randomness, for our purposes especially, if we're building poker players, right, then the way to think of randomness is as uncorrelation with other sequences, right? If I have a random sequence, what that means is that you couldn't predict, produce some other sequence that was likely to be similar, right? And if you could, then my sequence isn't random, right? And so that's a good definition for us. We really want our poker sequences, our poker hands to be uncorrelated with anything that the players could figure out, right? Because that's the whole point, right? And so if we can do that, then we're good enough. And the remainder of the talk today is all about this, all about, well, how do we figure out how to do that? Because that sounds like a kind of a challenging thing. Um, we're going to fail to some degree. Here's a preview. <laughs> but we can do a lot, lot better than people normally do. And that's what I really want to walk you through as sort of the core example here, is sort of walking through a lot of the mistakes people make and a lot of the ways you can get it better and better. And along the way, we'll see some other cool things about random that are big fun. I should say, this is a long format talk, which means that it's supposed to be full of activities and exercises. I'm not just supposed to talk at you for an hour and a half. Um, I have one small programming exercise in the middle, but mostly I'm going to talk at you for an hour and a half. So like I say, please ask. If you have questions, if you have comments, don't hesitate, because otherwise it's going to get boring. <laughs> um, OK, but we really aren't talking about sequences in general, right? Here we're talking about shuffling, because that's what we want to do with our poker server. And so the first thing we need to nail down is what do we mean by a fair shuffle? Um, you know, and there's an obvious definition. It's an easy definition to come up with if you know a tiny bit of math. You want all possible orderings of the deck to occur with the same likelihood, right? And this is the definition you'd write down if you thought about it for a second, right? Is, OK, I want every possible ordering of the deck to be equally likely after I'm done shuffling. And that means that sort of any of the 52 cards could be the fir first card with equal likelihood. And then any of the 51 remaining cards could be the second card with equal likelihood and so forth, right? And if you do that, then you end up with 52 factorial possible orderings, all of which are supposed to be equally likely. Um, that, by the way, is about 2 to the 226 possible orderings. It's about 10 to the 68 possible orderings. 10 to the 68 is one of those numbers that's so big it's not even worth thinking about. You know, one of the things we can't do um, to test our shuffling then, apparently, is to generate all the possible, you know, generate a bunch in 10 to the 68 decks and see that they're roughly equally distributed. That isn't going to happen because you don't have that much time or memory. So. What we're going to do instead is try to prove, prove mathematically that the shuffle, you know, we'll build an algorithm that we can mathematically prove generates all the permutations with equal likelihood. And if we can do that, then we don't have to think about it because the proof takes care of it all for us. And this is what proofs do, right? This is why I'm a computer scientist and not just a software developer, right? Is because I'm really excited about saying sometimes, you know, Throwing programs and CPU at things isn't enough. Sometimes we have to use math, too, because there's no other way to proceed. This is one of those times. So what we're going to do is develop an algorithm. And let me be clear, it's not my algorithm. Although I did invent it independently when I was in junior high, so I feel cool about that. But, but it's an old, old algorithm that will give us a fair shuffle, given that we have 
this. We have some machine attached to our computer that can somehow generate random integers in the range 1 to n given an n. So if I say, give me a random number between 1 and 5, this machine can give me a random number between 1 and 5. All right? We call this a random number generator. You all have played with random number generators before. We'll talk about that. Um, most of you haven't actually played with random number generators, but you've been played with random number generators, if I use enough air quotes. Um, so, but let's assume that our random number generator exists and is good, and we're now just going to say, well, let's concentrate on the algorithm first. How do we pick a random permutation of the cards given, you know, random arrangement of the cards given that we have a random number generator? Fair enough? All right, so we got a plan. Um, and the problem here is that, you know, how are we going to represent the cards inside a computer? Um, you know, this deck of cards model is kind of an interesting model. You might think of it as a linked list, except that you can work from the bottom or the top. So maybe it's a doubly linked list, except it's cheap to pull something out of the middle. You know, we don't really have a data structure that is a very good representation of this very, very simple physical object. So we're just going to give up and use an array. We're going to say, you know what? We'll just number the cards 1 through 52. We'll quit thinking about you know, what, what card number three is, you know, whether it's the three of queen of hearts or something else. We're just going to say, well, we have cards numbered one through 52. We're going to try to produce a random permutation of one through 52. Good enough? And we're going to produce it in an array so that we have it for later. Um, and what we'll do is start with a new deck. That is, we'll fill the array with the numbers one through 52 in order. Clear enough? And now we're going to try to shuffle them up. That's our plan. How many people have seen this and know everything that I'm about to say? Oh, good, good, good. Okay, so I'm not, bo I'm not boring most of the room. Okay, good, good, good. That's, that's good. Um, one possibility would be to try to simulate a human shuffle, and some people do that. Um, there's a bunch of good reasons not to do that. The first is that we don't actually understand the physics of human shuffles very well. Um, the second is that it really does take quite a bit of shuffling, um, Diaconis' theorem again, to actually stir things up very well. The third is that it's really awkward to simulate shuffling in an array setting. You probably need spare arrays and all kinds of counters and crud. It's, it's maybe not the best plan. Let's see if we can find something better than that, which sounds aggressive, but there it is. One of the interesting things, though, I should say about that is that it turns out that if you play with if you're used to playing poker with human shuffled hands and you start playing with random permutations, you'll find that the, hand, the, the, the hands don't look right. And that's not because the random permutations are broken. It's because human shuffling's broken. It doesn't produce random permutations the way most people do it. If you have the normal poker game thing where you give it a couple of riffle shuffles and call it a day, it turns out the hands end up a lot flatter than they should be. Um, and uh, because of the way the cards were sorted by the play and then, not sh and then, then mixed so that different people spread them out. And so you'll see a lot more freakish looking hands in a random permutation than you will in a normal thing. So we're going to get a different result. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but it's where we're going to go. Let's start with Captain Obvious's fail shuffle. This is the shuffle that everybody writes down when you ask them to write a shuffle. And I, I've done this experiment. I should say, part of the reason I'm giving this talk, part of the reason I wanted to be here, is because this is one of my pet peeves, is broken shuffle algorithms. Um, there's an awful lot of broken shuffle algorithms out there. And it's too bad because there, there's a well-known way to do it right, and you're going to understand it here in a few minutes. And so none of you should ever miss shuffle again. Uh, a person, one of the smartest people in the whole world that I know, I once had this interesting conversation where I, I that started with me saying, yeah, apparently it's really hard for people to shuffle cards. What do you mean by hard to shuffle cards? Well, they always get it wrong. Well, I didn't get it wrong. He had this. <laughs> and. Uh, it turned out that he'd built half a million hands that he was analyzing for a property uh, with this algorithm. He got to throw them all out after a couple of days of us arguing back and forth about why his thing wasn't producing random permutations. This looks like it ought to work, right? I'm just going to take every card in turn in the, in the array, every position in the array. I'm going to swap it with a random position, right? This has some huge advantages, right? It's in place, doesn't take any extra memory. It's fast, right? And if you do it, I promise that if you implement this algorithm, you'll look at it and you'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 that looks shuffled. And this is what I was saying earlier. It's really dangerous to say that looks shuffled, right? Because 
you know, there's an awful lot of choices. It can be really hard to distinguish. But I promise you that the statistics from this come out all skewed. They come out all skewed for the funny reason that um, the elements near the front, right, are going to jump toward the end because on average they'll move later. They have to, right? And then you're going to come back and hit them again later, which means that they're going to jump back. And it skews all the probabilities up compared to the last ones, which only jump back once. And yeah, it's a mess. Um, some, things, some cards get moved more times than others. In fact, in the worst case, right, one card gets moved all around the deck, and none of the other cards move at all. That can't be what you wanted. <laughs> yeah. Well, not really, right? I mean, so this is one way, and this, you're jumping ahead a little bit. It's a great observation, right? One way that I might shuffle the deck, right, is to just pick a random card out, right? Put it down. Pick the next random card out. Put it down, right? That's easier, right? That's the easy thing to do, right? That isn't what this does, right? And that's part of why you should be suspicious that this is broken, is because it's not easy to see an equivalence with that. Does everybody accept that this thing I'm doing, if I, do it, if I really pick each card randomly, will give me a random permutation? Sure, that's easy, right? And that's where we're going. I'm going to show you a variant of exactly that trick. So great observation. Um, no, it's because you're trying to be clever. By the way, the other obvious thing to do that people do is, well, they just take random pairs of cards and swap them. And that works for some value of works, right? Except the problem is, how do I know when to stop, right? I mean, I really want the cards to be thoroughly shuffled, well, maybe n shuffles, is, maybe 52 swaps is enough, probably not, right? I probably need to do more than that because I'm picking random pairs, I want to make sure everything gets hit. And in fact, there's a theorem that says it takes exponential time to hit all the cards, so you probably didn't want to do that. Um, and again, the problem is you'll get something that looks pretty shuffled if you just eyeball it. And it might even pass die hard, but maybe not. Here's another bad shuffle algorithm that you see a lot in the literature. Um, what if I use sorting to shuffle? Woo -hoo. So what I'll do is I'll just pick a random key and attach it to each card, right? A random number, say, between 1 and 1,000. And I'll sort then according to the random keys, right? And pretty clearly, that's a random permutation, right? Everybody's happy with that. Yeah? Well, almost. Almost. There's this little problem, right? Because if I really pick the things randomly, what if there's a tie? As you know, most sorts, well, all sorts are likely to be deterministic. Even if they're not stable, they're deterministic. And the ties will always be broken in the same way, whichever way it is. Ah, oh, so my permutations aren't quite right. So probably if I find things that have the same key, I'm going to have, after my sort, which is when I can check it, then I'm going to have to retry some stuff. I'm going to have to relabel some cards and try again. But if you're using UIDs or something that's really... So the more random bits I use, the less likely it is that I'll have one of these collisions. Absolutely. And so maybe I should just use really long keys. The problem is that really long keys are really expensive to generate. Remember that random number generator I prom we, we're, we're depending on that's going to generate this stuff for me? It turns out the more bits it has to generate of random stuff, the more expensive it's going to be, and I don't like that very much. So now I have this hard engineering trade-off between having to do some retries and having to generate a bunch of extra random bits that aren't doing anything. And the other problem with this is that sorting still in log n, right? I mean, maybe we can make it linear time, but it's going to have terrible const, you know, with a with the right kind of sort, but it's going to have terrible constants. Sorting's still expensive, right? I don't really want to pay that extra cost. With 52 cards, it's not so bad. If I'm going to do black, deal blackjack and shuffle six decks, it starts to get a little worse. But it's an extra cost I don't need to pay, as it turns out. So this is one of the, another one of those algorithms that sort of works for some value of work. You can make it work, um, but nah, not so good, especially since the thing that Eric suggested is exactly the thing that we actually want to do and that works out really, really crazily well. We're going to pick a random card out of the deck, and then we're going to stack it on top of a new deck, right? So, you know, we, we, we have to call our random number generator with, you know, 
to generate a number between 1 and 52, then 1 and 51, 1 and 50, and so forth, right? And if I do that, then with that many calls, to the, with 52 calls to the random number generator, actually 51 if you're careful, then I can sit there and build a deck that everybody agreed. Everybody in the room was like, yeah, yeah, that's going to be a random sequence. And I agree with you. It will be a random permutation. All right. The problem with this, as it's implemented, as we just described it, is arrays. Arrays are a pain in the neck. I'm going to end up needing an extra destination array, right? Because I need to stack the cards sort of in a destination. Oh, now I've got 2n space. That's not so good. It's not terrible, but it's not great. The other problem with it is that I kind of have to count down to the card I want, right? Because, so even though arrays are randomly accessible in constant time, I don't get to do that. Because I have to count, I, I generate a random number in this case between 1 and 4, and then I count down to where it is. And I can't not do that. If I, if I hit a hole, I can't like move around to it, or else I don't pull these things out randomly. It's bad. I have to actually walk through the array every time. So now I've got this algorithm that's n squared on the one hand. It's not fast. And on the other hand, requires extra memory, 2n memory. That's not so good. We'd like to fix those things. But it does have the property, right, that it's a very, you know, it does generate a random sequence. So if we can fix those two problems, that it's slow and that it takes extra memory, then we'll have the algorithm we want. Yes? All right. Let's fix those problems one at a time. Let's first figure out how to plug the holes. Because if the, if the array was all, you know, if when I, my random number generator generated a random number, if the source array was all up at the top, right, then I could just go directly to the right element. I wouldn't have to do any counting. And, but to do that, every time I make a hole, I'm going to have to plug the hole somehow. Well, what can I plug the hole with? Ah. It turns out I can just plug the hole, right, with the last element from the source array. I can just pick it up and move it into the hole after I've made it. Because I'm just going to select randomly from these elements anyway. I don't really care what order they're in, right, coming out of there. And so all I have to do is just make sure that every time I make a hole, I immediately plug it with the bottom element. Yeah? And so if I do that, now I actually get an algorithm that's linear time, right? Because I can sit there and just move each, you know, each card moves exactly twice, right? At most twice, right? It moves at once from the end into a hole and then another time, you know, over to the other end. And so I have this nice bound. This is fast. This is way faster than that stupid shuffle sort thing, uh, that stupid sorting shuffle thing. Um, but it still takes extra memory. We don't like that very much. It's not as big a deal, but it's something we ought to fix, yeah? Well, how are we going to fix it? Well, the cool thing to fix it is that you notice that every time you pull that element up to fill the hole, oh, you leave a blank spot. So rather than sticking the thing over in the, in the other array, maybe you should just put it in the blank spot you just left, right? Because you're never going to touch that again. That, that, memory down below there is in the array is, mm, that's all, we're all done with that as far as source stuff. Ah, so now the source and destination are, share the same array. And again, you'll get things backwards, but it doesn't really matter. You're generating a random permutation. Generating the reverse of random permutations works out to be the same thing, doesn't care. So now I get this algorithm that's completely in place. I sit there and pick a random element, and I swap it with the last element. Right? Oh, linear time, efficient use of the random number generator, in place. This is known as the Newth Morris Pratt sorting algorithm. You can look it up on lines in Wikipedia. In fact, a lot of the description there in the pseudocode was mine, so um, <laughs> I can vouch for it, at least. Um, or at least what it used to be. I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, and this is how you should shuffle. Um, here's the pseudocode. Um, notice that this pseudocode looks almost exactly like Captain Obvious's fail shuffle that we started with. Almost exactly like it. And the only difference, the only tiny little thing you have to do is instead of picking a random number between 1 and 52, you pick a random number that might be, you know, that's in a different range. Oh. Oh. Well, that's pretty cool. Because now we've got a pseudo random number generator that, um, that you know, now we've, got a, now we've got an algorithm that has all the properties, good properties Captain Obvious's fail shuffle had, and it also has this additional property that it produces actual shuffles. Yay! Um, 
It's really easy to make little bugs. For example, if you don't allow for the possibility of exchanging an element with itself, then you'll get weird distributions, so, don't, so be careful about that. It's really easy to make little performance improvements. For example, you obviously don't need to do the last swap because it's gonna guaranteed swap an element with itself. You can go away. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of swapped this around. I should have I should have rewritten the pseudocode to be one dot dot j. You're right. I mean, it, it works out the same way, but then you have to count backwards. And eh. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. Uh, this is a little bit frobbed around. It all works out the same. And if you look on the Wikipedia page for the Newth Morth Pratt shuffle, you'll see all different variants, including one that doesn't start with filling the array with integers, which is kind of nice because it saves you again some time. Um, but basically, this solves our problem. We now, all we need is a little random number generator, and the shuffle part's all taken care of for our poker server. All we need. All we need, yes. Oh, shoot. I just spent the first 15 minutes explaining why that was a big ask. So now we got to figure out what we're going to do. Let's start with what most people do, which is to generate numbers that are not random, but pseudo-random, fake random. Right? Um, the pseudo here is a very academic word for fake. Um, and they're fake in the sense that they are correlated with something, right? They're correlated with the generator that produced them. If you knew what the generator was that produced this sequence of numbers, you could reproduce it exactly because it's deterministic. But it hopefully isn't correlated with anything else. You hopefully, without knowing what the generator is that produced it, you'd have a hard time reproducing this sequence of random numbers. That would be the ideal. Okay, here's, here's, uh, oh, and by the way, if what, we, what we're going to do is generate, what you traditionally do is generate random numbers in some 1 to m, the range 1 to m, where m is some very large fixed constant, like 2 to the 32nd or 2 to the 64th. If you have big random numbers like that, then you can more or less get small random numbers by sort of using the remainder operation, by, by taking the remainder, you know, if I want to generate a random number between one and seven, I can take the remainder of this giant random number mod, you know, remain, divi after dividing by seven. And that modulus will get the thing down into range. I said more or less, right? There's some error here because two to the 64th and seven don't have a common factor. And so there's this little bit of extra out at the end that's gonna screw you up. The numbers aren't quite uniformly random, but they're close. And for most purposes, people's purposes, we're like, who cares? If you want to fix that, what you can do is if you end up with generating one of these random numbers that's way out in the last six of your two to the 64th range, then you retry. You rerun the random generator. And that's pretty much the only way you can fix it that's provable. Good enough? So we have a way to generate small random numbers given big ones. and um, and so now we have everything we need for our shuffle if we can do this. Um, notice these numbers are still not random. If I know the algorithm, they're predictable. But for our purposes, maybe that's good enough. Here's a standard kind of generator that generates pseudo-random numbers. This is a pretty standard approach. You'll see this a lot. This is the mul multiplicative linear congruential pseudo-random number generator. You actually will see more additive congruential generators, but this one was simpler to explain, so I picked this one. Um, what you do here is you start with some seed value, because you have to have some way of, you know, remember, this is all going to be deterministic once we get it going, right? So if I'm going to get a random sequence, I need to pick a random starting point for my sequence, right? And that's, so I still have this problem. If I had a thing that would generate a random number, right? I could use it to generate a lot of pseudo-random numbers, right? Um, but, so we're now pushing the question back again, right? Every time we're like, okay, now we're ready. No, not quite. But let's push that aside for a moment and assume we have some seed value, way to get a seed, random seed value to start with. Now what we're going to do is let r be the remainder mod our n of the thing, and then we're going to take the seed and we're going to multiply it by some constant and then take the remainder mod m, and that's going to give us the next seed value. So we're just going to keep updating the seed with new values. It turns out that if you pick a and m just so, this will produce a sequence that looks pretty random. 
looks pretty random. What does that mean? Well, it passes die hard. It does, you know, it's, it's, it's random. It's uncorrelated with obvious sequences. Woohoo. That's still not going to be good enough, but it's a start. So notice that you must never let s be 0 here, right? If s ever becomes 0, you're done for. So if you pick a and m relatively prime, then s will never be 0 unless it starts that way. And so that's one condition on a and m. Um, there are other conditions you can use. Here is the, a sequence output by one of these with a is 55, m is 251, s is 12, and n is 15. And do those look like they're random numbers in the range 0 to 15? Oh, sure, by i they're just fine, right? They're pseudo-random. Notice that 12 repeats. If you never see repeats in your pseudo-random sequence, it probably isn't a pseudo-random sequence because you know, numbers should repeat once in a while. Heck, if you run a long enough sequence, you should expect to see the same number twice in a row. And you can do statistics for all this. This is the kind of test that Marsaglia does. Um, by the way, these coefficients were taken from this paper. Um, I didn't make them up myself. This is about a six-page paper talking about conditions on A&M that make this work well. Um, picking A and M well is hard. <laughs> and like I say, normally you'd pick a giant M and A. Um, I picked a small one just to make it easy to understand what was going on. I, you, normally you would pick it to be 2 to the 32nd, M to be around 2 to the 32nd or 2 to the 64th so that it fit in a machine word, and then you'd pick the A big so that you got good wrap. Yeah? Uh, well, you said earlier that if they're relatively prime, then they work out okay. Well, if they're relatively prime, you'll never get s going to 0 by mistake, which is good, because if you ever get s going to 0, then 0 times anything is 0. The remainder is going to be 0, and now s is stuck at 0 forever. But there are other conditions that make it so that you don't get obvious patterns um, that you know, aren't that. <laughs> so yeah, you, you really want to be careful about how you choose A and M. You typically choose A and M to be primes and not just any prime. Yeah. Why does not having A and M be kind of a random C, like S is, add to the randomness? Because like I say, if you pick, don't pick A and M very carefully, you'll f end up with this sequence with patterns in them. And so you really just want to fix A and M and let S do all the work here. Um, because you've picked it out of a table that somebody spent a month thinking about how to build. <laughs> yeah. Think of it as kind of a wheel. Um, what we do is sort of spin the wheel, and the remainder operation is sort of however much is left over after you, know, you go a bunch of times around the wheel. And so if you pick A and M carefully, then you, know, you end up at sort of a random place each time. Uh, that's probably the best way to think about that generator. So this produces random numbers that for a lot of pseudo-random numbers that for a lot of purposes are good enough. If you're doing a scientific experiment and trying to measure correlations you know, that, with that, if you're doing modeling or something, then those are probably good enough. Um, this is the point where I guess I'd like to take five minutes and we'll have a little race. And it really should take five minutes for somebody. Everybody who has laptops, go ahead and implement this nice little uh, linear congruential generator. And then go ahead and implement a random shuffle and the first person who thinks they've correctly implemented both those things, raise their hand. Sounds good? It'll be a nice little break. Can you have the back? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I forgot to put those on the slide. That wasn't very good. Let me fix that right now. Um, yeah, let me give you this whole bullet because that'll give you a test. Oops. Let me try to give you this whole bullet. I guess I've got to get out of projection mode here. Magic mode's not helping me. Let me try to give you a sample output as well so that you actually, why can't I select anything today? Is that really too much to ask of my fine presentation tool? There we go, no, no. <laughs> really, I just want to select all this text. It shouldn't be like pulling teeth. There we go. Da, 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 da. There we go. That's better. <clears throat> so yeah, that'll give you one test, which actually is probably enough tests that you can be pretty confident if you get that same output that you did it right.
I'm guessing you'll end up with 15 lines of code if you do this just so. Less than hassle. Be a little careful, because you notice that all my stuff is one-based, which is kind of mean. <laughs> Probably your computer language has zero-based arrays, so watch out. <laughs> After 35 years in this business, I still think human beings start counting at one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess I should make this big again. How do I do that? I push this button. No, sorry. Uh, I thought it was set to do the right thing. My bad. There we go. My apologies. Bad settings in the toy. <clears throat> So given that there's a 1 in 15 chance at each spot, probably if you get the first three numbers right, you're OK, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, you started by outputting 12. That's, that's not crazy talk um, at all. Um, and in fact, that's what that generator, the way I wrote it, will give you. So yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're done. Good, good, good. Somebody, somebody's already got it. Is everybody else close? Okay. What? What are we doing with the R there? Oh, that's just the result. Sorry, that's the thing you actually return from the generator when you call it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So a couple people have got it. What language did you use? Python. Okay. What, what did you use? Python. Ah, so Python is apparently the fastest programming language for implementing shuffling <laughs> and random number generation. Good to know. So I'm going to go ahead and move on if people are cool with that, and we will. Uh, the, the rest of you can go ahead and finish up you know, as, as we talk. Um, that way I will not have your full attention, which, uh, whatever. <laughs> um, it's all good. But I thought it'd be fun to see how easy this is, right? 15 lines of code, and you've got all the stuff you need to do this more or less right. And yet, people do it wrong all the time. Uh, this is where a little knowledge is a benevolent thing, I think, um, is, you know, finding out how it should work is always worth doing. So, we still have to pick a random seed, and that's one problem with this. Um, there's a lot of really, really bad ideas. I'll talk about those more in a bit. The classic thing to do is to use the time of day in milliseconds. Um, this turns out to be a really bad idea um, because that's pretty predictable um, <laughs> if you know what's going on. Um, the other problem with these generators is, remember we said, well, you know, the only thing, you shouldn't be able to, it's not enough that the things look random to test like Die Hard. It's that a malicious person, right? If I'm building solitaires, we'd be pretty much done now, right? We'd be like, okay, this shuffles cards well enough that my solitaire can be big fun. If we're playing poker, then I really want to figure out what the cards are coming because I want to know what cards my opponents have. That makes my poker game a lot easier. <laughs> and this generator has the unfortunate property that if you give me a short sequence of outputs, it turns out there's some simple math you can do that actually makes it easy to figure out what S is. And once you know what S is, then you know the whole future, right, of this entire random number generator. Oh, not so good for poker. 
It turns out this apparently actually happened at least once. There's a URL here. Um, these guys, know, somebody published, because they were trying to assure people that their poker server was fair, they published the source code to their shuffler, which was broken. It was Captain Obvious's fail shuffle. And, to the, the, and the pseudo random number generator they used, which was one of these later congruential generators. And so these people, and they admitted that the seed for this was the time of day in milliseconds. And so these people guessed the time of day in milliseconds, tried all the ones around there that seemed like they were plausible, ran the generator forward until they found one that was producing the sequence they wanted. And so from that, they could, by the time the flop happened, they, they could see five cards and they knew what everything else was. Yay. <laughs> and so they made a bunch of money off this and then published. And I can't tell whether they're being dis disingenuous or whether they just didn't know. But they did this by brute force on the seed. They never used the fact that the linear congruential generator is reversible. And their recommendation for making it more secure was to use a better linear congruential generator. And like I said, I don't know if that's because they wanted to be able to keep taking advantage or because they just didn't know. It turns out this whole generator structure is a really bad idea for our poker server. We're going to fix it later. OK? So, but still, you know, what we want, let's fix that first, in fact. What we really want is a better pseudo-random number generator. What we want is what's called a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator. What does that mean? It's a fancy way of saying nobody knows, given a sequence of outputs of the generator, without the secret, without knowing what the seed is, nobody knows how to figure out the seed. And that's the property we really like our generator to have, right? Because that means that if I sit there and see the down cards in my poker server, I can't infer anything about the cards that aren't down. Yay! That would be nice. Um, you can build these. There's a bunch of them on the internet. My favorite, and I don't know why it isn't notated on the slide, is a thing called Isaac. Um, it, they generally are more expensive. Notice that, that that MLCG we built was cheap, right? One multiply per random number and one remainder per random number. The remainder's not a scary cheap operation, but I don't think that's going to break our poker server. Even if we have a million people playing at a time, I think we can probably manage a million remainder operations a second. It's, it's going to be OK. Yeah? So um, these are a little more expensive, but they're doable. One thing to notice is that, I don't know why that says M. It should probably be S. Um, anyway, all these things have to be big. Remember we said there are 10 to the 63rd possible hands? Well, that means that if your seed doesn't, isn't at least as big, you know, isn't, can't be at least as big as 10 to the 63rd, there's no way you could generate all possible poker hands, right? Because there isn't enough bits in there to allow that to happen. And so there's another mistake that people make, is they don't use generators with big enough states. So we're not looking for just any pseudo-random number generator. We're looking for a Pseudo, a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator with large internal state. Woohoo! These exist. You can go find them. And this is what most people would choose for their um, poker server if they were smart. Like I say, apparently most people don't choose it because they're way better at writing PHP code than they are at actually doing this part. But most people would if they knew what they were doing. Pick a generator like Isaac that has huge internal state and use that to generate their poker hands. Except, oh, we still have to pick S. Remember, these guys brute forced it not from anything special about the generator. They just guessed initial seeds until they found the one that worked. And that was easy for them to do because all they had to do is just guess right around the time of day in milliseconds. And they pointed out that once they guessed one of them correctly, then their clock was synchronized with the clock on the <laughs> other computer. And the next one, they were pretty much right on. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so don't do that. So in fact, there's a bunch of terrible ways to choose S. You know, the system clock's very predictable. A lot of people use the process identifier, you know, get PID. Uh, that's small and predictable. Uh, really, really bad idea. Um, the, a, a classic thing that TLS, that SSL, sorry, back when it was SSL, that they used to use was they would just take a hash of all of memory. Um, that was a bad idea in several reasons. It was surprisingly predictable. You would be surprised how predictable a random hash of memory can be, in particular how it can change predictably over time. 
And in particular, it also may leak system information. Uh, yay! <laughs> so, um, and the worst thing about it is that if you do two hashes of memory really fast, it's, there's a good chance they'll be the same. So don't do that. The other classic thing to do is user timing. And this is what, for example, SSH uses for its seed, for its stuff, which is the same kind of application is we time the time between users' keystrokes or the time between, you know, the, the speed of their mouse motions or things like that. That's great for a lot of purposes, but again, the problem with that one is that it's under user control. So if you're using information that comes from me to decide to deal how to poker, how to deal poker hands, that doesn't Sounds so good, right? Maybe you use the information coming from some random person, but are they really random, or is it just me again over on another, you know, multiplay, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I don't like any of those things very well, right? So maybe I can find something better. Maybe I can find a better plan than these terrible ways. There's two sort of standard ways, and it depends. So now we're, we're going to end up in a space where the limiting factor on this is how many random bits a second do we need? Look, if I were playing one poker hand a minute on my server, I could sit there and get 20 10-sided dice, right? I could build a little machine that would drop the dice and a webcam that would take them from left to right, and that would give me a random 20-digit number, right? Then there could be, the machine could dump them back into the bin and dump them again, right? I could get one of those little ball machines like we have in the, they have for the lottery, right? That just shakes up ping pong balls and then lets them pop up. I could get nice random numbers out of that. The problem is it's slow, right? I mean, it's mechanically slow, right? I really can't do 1,000 hands a second this way unless I have a whole room full of ping pong ball machines. That seems nuts. That seems insane. But it does have the advantage that you're pretty confident that it's producing random numbers um, because physics is like that. It turns out that Linux, at least, and I think these days most operating systems use a similar trick. But instead of ball machines, you've probably never seen one of those hooked up to a machine, but instead of ball machines, they uh, use stuff that's already floating around. So for example, Peter Gutman has this really nice paper that I should have put a citation in my talk slides to, talking about how when your hard disk, old school spinning media, you remember that from the 2000s, um, when, when it spins, the head air piles up, it swirls around, and so the spin rate, the rotational rate of the disk is actually a little bit random. It doesn't take the same amount of time every time around, it depends on the stirring of air inside the hard drive. And it turns out that that's somewhat provably random, physically random. And so you can pick a few bits per disk read of randomness out of the bottom of the disk read time that you're guaranteed are really random bits. Woohoo! And Ethernet packet arrival times. Well, the user has pretty good control over when you get a packet, but not to the microsecond they don't. And it turns out there's some provable sort of randomness in the Ethernet chip that affects the inner arrival time. And again, you know, the bottom three bits of the user's keyboard typing rate are probably random. And so we start piling up sources of random likeness like this, and we build what's called an entropy pool. We build up a, a, a container that has a bunch of random bits that have all been mixed together in it. And when we need an S, we pull bits out of the entropy pool to get that S. And for medium rate generation of random bits, that works really well. It requires no special hardware beyond what was already attached to your computer already, and it's way faster than our ping pong ball machine was. It's not so fast, though. It's pretty easy to run the entropy pool out of bits. Linux has dev random and dev u random. Now, dev random, when you pull bits out of it, it goes and gets them out of the entropy pool. And if the entropy pool doesn't have enough bits, if there isn't enough randomness left in the pool, it will block you until there is. So you get bits that are guaranteed to be pretty damn random, but you may have to wait. Um, there's also dev u random. What dev u random does is when you ask it for bits and it doesn't have any left in the pool, it saved aside a little seed of random bits that it uses to run a 
cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator. And so now you get pseudo-random bits that hopefully are secure enough, but they come instantly or faster anyway. Yeah? Okay. So now you know why dev random and dev random, you random work. What you'd really like is to build a machine like our ping pong ball machine, except way faster. Um, so that it generates thousands or tens of thousands or millions of bits a second of random. Um, and you know that then you can sit, so what you do is you pick some physical phenomenon, say thermal noise that's provably a random phenomenon, and you sit there and make physical measurements really fast. This is a piece of hardware with a build cost of about um, $5, well, a little more than that, six or seven dollars, that, um, so we could sell it for about 15, that actually measures a diode um, measures, this diode right here is a Zener diode, so if you don't know electronics, it's okay, it doesn't really matter. The important thing to notice about this circuit is that right here what we're doing is running a, this Zener diode in avalanche mode, it's right at its breakdown voltage. It turns out that that's noisy, the breakdown voltage varies over time because of quantum effects, and so you can sit there and get out a high frequency random signal out of that diode. And then you run it through an amplifier and a comparator, and you get out sort of a random bit stream. There's a whole bunch more of that circuit, obviously. There's a microcontroller on here and a bunch of stuff. But this is the interesting part from a random number generator point of view. The only problem so far we've had is that this circuit doesn't work. <laughs> I was hoping it would be working by the time I got here, but we haven't finished debugging it yet. It turns out that doing this is incredibly fiddly. There's a million ways that you can go horribly, horribly wrong, and we seem to have gone wrong most of them, um, even knowing it going in. Um, it's really easy for this to pick up noise from somewhere and be very, very non-random. It's really easy to um, lose frequencies here and have this be very, very slow and how it varies. There's a lot of ways you can screw this up. And so we're still working on this circuit. We have hopes that in the next month or two we'll be able to actually put these out and you'll be able to buy them. Is this a place where there's been a lot of open hardware work? Uh, no, not a lot. Um, yeah, it's an obvious thing, but like I say, it's a little tricky. And frankly, again, the purpose of this talk was to get you to the point, get the people in the room to the point where they would actually care about buying one of these, right, partly. <laughs> because it's not obvious, right, until we walk you through a whole bunch of complicated logic why this even matters to have one of these guys. And, you know, our claim is that, well, so what there is, so the CPU manufacturers tried to save us all, in a way. Um, if you look at any modern CPU of any size, you'll find a random number, there's a hardware random number generator buried in it. And you can sit there and make some instruction call and it will spit you out hardware random numbers. Maybe. The problem is, it's a closed source generator. Um, there's every reason, every motivation for the NSA or whoever to make it less random than it ought to be in various ways. Plus, like I say, these things are fiddly. They're incredibly easy to screw up. So even if the CPU manufacturers are completely free of any outside influence, which by the way, there's evidence that that's not true. I'm not just paranoid here. There, you know, there, there's actual things that would make you suspect that. But even if it were true, they still could have screwed it up really super easily. And it turns out that the pseudo-random number generators, for whatever reason, the hardware random number generators they bury in there are slow. This thing, our target speed is really to fill up a full speed USB connection. We'd really like to be able to generate a million random bits a second. That seems like a doable thing, if we can get the hardware right. Um, they, they typically generate much, much less than that. So again, they play games with pseudo-random, with cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators to amplify the amount of randomness. Uh, I don't want to be there, I just want random bits. I want this to generate S's with. I can generate pseudo-random bits all by myself. I know how to do that. So, um, so no, I don't know any other open hardware project that's even this far um, being broken. There's a couple of closed hardware projects out there that will sell you something like this for $150. 
Uh, I'm not nearly as excited at $150. It's hard to persuade people they care enough. If I were running a poker server, would I buy one of those? Oh, yes, of course. If I just want it on the off chance I would want some random bits, maybe not. <laughs> this, I will definitely own one of and have it plugged into all my machines just because, you know, my desktop machines, all my rack mount machines, just because why not? It's $15. And I, what I use random bits for more than anything else is generating random passwords. It's really nice to have hardware random bits for passwords. And I run, the, I run dev random out all the time, generating passwords. It's like, <laughs> and that was what got me. I started on this project, and then I found out the same week, B. Dale and Keith had also started on this same project. It's like, OK, let's do this together. <laughs> it's one of those open tech just in time things. Yeah, yeah, somebody had a question. Is there a reason, once you get this working, that every computer I buy from then on would have one? Like I say, I think it's important I think, I, I'm not usually, I don't want to sound like one of these super paranoid, weird cyberpunk people, but I think it's really important that what we have is open hardware and open source, that the random bit stream we come out, we can sit there and check it and verify it. Even if the motherboard manufacturers started ch sticking this circuit on their motherboards, I'd be really paranoid about it. Not just, again, not just because of the NSA, but also because of, um, like I say, it's really easy, even if you get all the electronics right, it's really easy to physically mount this too close to a noise source or do something, you know, to a, sorry, to a non-noise source, a signal source, or do something else that screws up the layout. And now you get these bits out that, again, it's really hard to tell without a lot of really sensitive statistical testing that you're not getting random bits out. And so now I have this thing that looks random but isn't, Ew, not so happy, right? The nice thing about this thing is I'm pretty sure I can engineer it so it'll be reasonably bulletproof. Well, I and B. Dale and Keith, they're, they're way better at this than I am, can engineer this so that it's reasonably bulletproof and so that you will believe, as an engineer looking at it, that it's reasonably bulletproof. And so I think this is a better approach, given how cheap we can make it. And you know, this $15 number I'm talking about is our target price. It's not how cheap it could be. If we made 100,000 of them, it would come way down even from that. You know, The microcontroller on here is, the most expensive piece probably, but the, the connector is probably the second, USB connector is probably the second most expensive piece. So, <laughs> um, it's not a very expensive build. Anyway, um, yeah, this project's on, on B. Dale's website um, if you want to look at the current state of it. But like I say, we're still debugging it. We will hopefully have it working in the next month or two. It's really on my short list, so that one will get done. Yeah. yeah so do you have a link to that? Or? Yeah, yeah, like I say, if you go to Garby and Garby, um, git.gag.com is where it is. I should have put a URL. Anyway, you can talk to, talk to me later, but it's at git.gag.com. It's called USBTRNG. Um, Keith P. has some stuff on his blog about it, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. And I'd love to, if, if somebody who has good hardware skills wants to help, I would love to have your help. It's the kind of thing where we need to build some prototypes, do some measurement to figure out what's going on. So that's most of it. I want to talk a little bit about sort of, OK, we've solved our poker server problem to some extent. We finished this piece of hardware. We plug it in. It lets us generate S's. We now are running a crypto secure PRNG. We're using that to generate random numbers that we're getting using in our shuffling algorithm that we have, know is producing good shuffles. Woohoo! We can now play poker. Um, there's some other things you can do with random numbers, too. <laughs> uh, there's a whole talk that I really don't have time to give about for example, about selection and sampling from different things, from generating different distributions, right? So far, we've talked about uniform random numbers. Everything has the same probability. A lot of times, that isn't what you want, right? You want some other distribution. You want random numbers with a Gaussian probability with a given mean and variance, for example. Or you want random numbers that act like three dice. Um, those distributions, there's tricks for taking uniform random numbers and turning them into those distributions. There's also tricks for going the other way, flattening distributions that aren't what you wanted. Um, that's called whitening, and it's something you typically do with pseudo random number, with hardware random number generators, is you don't trust the random bits, and so you then run them through more crypto tricks to make them less, you know, so that if there is some non-randomness, it gets whitened away um, to some extent. We use this a lot in modeling. If you're building a model of something, because the real world's random, you might want to put random factors in your model. Um, there was a really nice study a while back, a meta study of about 20 or 30 large studies of things like climate and other stuff that concluded that all of them were completely broken 
<laughs> in the way they generated and used random numbers to the point where you couldn't trust any of their conclusions. <laughs> like, ah! Um, this stuff's hard. And you know, the problem with modeling applications is they want a lot of random numbers a second, right? And so it's really tempting to use a really terrible generator, or, and especially if you don't know what you're doing because you're a scientist and not a computer scientist. Um, watch out for that. If you're doing modeling, get some help from somebody on that part of it because it's really an easy place to go wrong. Obviously, like I say, cryptography, generating keys for ciphers should be done with a hardware, you know, with good randomness of some kind. If you're not using random keys, then you've got a real, real problem. Um, yeah, this is a quote, of course. Um, Lisa, you know, they're gonna play, is gonna play rock, scissors, paper with Bart, and she's thinking, poor Bart, he always picks rock. And Bart's thinking, good old rock, you can always count on rock. Um, the, um, the game of rock, scissors, paper, right, is interesting, because it's a game that it turns out you can't play deterministically. A computer, it, out of the box is a terrible, terrible rock, scissors, paper player. It can't really play because it's always going to pick rock. I mean, it's a deterministic machine or whatever, you know, whatever. And so all this machinery we chose is actually necessary. John Nash has this nice theorem that shows that sort of in some, uh, or von Neumann, somebody, some combination of them, has a nice theorem that shows that in some games, like rock, scissors, paper, your only best strategy has to be a mixed strategy. It has to be a strategy that randomly chooses stuff. Um, everybody knows that the, the right mixed strategy for rock, scissors, paper is to choose with equal probability the three outcomes. It turns out that isn't necessarily the right strategy. Um, there's a, uh, a friend of mine some years ago ran the first and second international computer rock, scissors, paper tournament. And you'd think that would be boring because all the machines would be playing randomly. No, because he threw in some machines that didn't play randomly. He threw in always choose rock and some other stuff like that. And so now you had to exploit the non-randomness of machines that were non-random, which means that you had to play somewhat non-randomly yourself. And so now this strategy gets really, really interesting. Um, but still, the winning things used a mixed strategy because if you didn't, you were obviously done for. Um, you know, poker is another good example. You know, if you never bluff, probably you're not gonna do very well in poker. If you always bluff, you're probably gonna do even worse in poker, right? And so you, you need to bluff randomly. You have to pick some random percentage of the time to bluff. We're gonna need randomness for this. Nobody knows you know, what is the best bluffing strategy, right? There is a mixed strategy that's optimal. You could, in principle, find that. Nobody's come anywhere close to doing that calculation, even for two-player poker. Um, I wanna end with this. Because we still have a problem here, right? Which is, I publish everything I'm doing on my poker server. Say, hey, look, I'm, you know, hardware random numbers and, you know, cryptographically secure and a real shuffle algorithm. And look, you can trust my poker server. And they're like, no, how do I know that's what you're really running? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's great that you make these claims. You clearly at least understand what a real poker server would look like. That puts you ahead of the pack. But why should I believe you? Um, and... It turns out, and this is a funny, funny result that really goes back to the beginning of public key cryptography, that I can actually arrange things in such a way that I don't have to trust the other end. This is what's called telephone poker or metal poker. And, you know, as uh, it started with an old joke, you know, these two metal chess players said, oh, let's play poker instead. And the guy's like, fine, I'll deal. Um, <laughs> you know, the, um, the, um, the funny part is, it turns out you can actually rig the game in such a way that each side forces randomness on the other, and then both sides can check at the end that they didn't cheat. So you can't actually prevent cheating, but you can prevent, find out at the end if the other player cheated by checking sort of that both sides' randomness was equally incorporated. It's a really cool idea. I'm about halfway through writing up a paper based on an, uh, a protocol I worked out in the early 1980s for doing this without public key cryptography. I think it's really a fun, interesting exercise to do it that way. But typically, like I say, the protocols use public key cryptography. They have some problems. But 
the idea that you can do this at all is really, really cool. And arguably, that would be the next step for our poker server. It's to say, you know what? We're not only going to be random, we're going to be random, verifiably random on every hand. And by the way, um, part of what makes this work is that poker is an adversary game. It's like rock, scissors, paper. If I'm not random, you, you might exploit my randomness. And so I'm motivated to be, ra to be random, just you know, to, to shuffle randomly, just like you're motivated to shuffle randomly, because if either side doesn't, the other side will take advantage of that. And so the protocols work essentially by I shuffle the deck, I pass you the deck, and you shuffle it without being able to tell what the cards were I passed you. And if either side doesn't shuffle well, well, it's on them if the game, you know, if they get in trouble. And so it's the adversary nature of games that sort of makes this work out as a thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there, sorry, I, I, think I, I think I gave you some TLAs, which isn't a very useful form of reference here. Um, RSA here is Ravesh Shamir and Ailman, the people behind the RSA crypto system. GNM is, uh, oh, God. So these are papers about how to achieve, like, how, how to play telephone poker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're titled telephone, mental poker. I think people are using the term mental poker and telephone poker both in that era. I think these papers both have mental poker in the title. If you go to Google Scholar and look up mental poker, oh, that, that's a, uh, Gabarani, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, I would have been able to tell you before you asked the question who these guys are. Anyway, if you, go, if you go to Google Scholar and type in mental poker, you'll get all the classic references and they're really, they're quite readable papers and there's all kinds of interesting critique and back and forth. It's a really interesting area to look at, for sure. Um, and that's most of what I wanted to tell you today. Um, I guess, like I say, my motivation for putting this particular talk together is sort of to get people to know some things that everybody should know if they're going to be working with computers about random, and to get you to pay attention to random. I think it's really, really easy to sort of do some half-assed thing when random pops up and then be really sorry later that you did. Or worse yet, to not be sorry because you never noticed the terrible thing that happened as a result. Um, it would be really easy for me to do a 10-week course on this stuff. You know, this is an hour and a half of a 10-week course, effectively. And so there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to figure out and understand. But hopefully this at least gives you some survey, some lay of the land. Um, it's important to get it right. And so hopefully, you know, I've told you enough that you can more or less get it right. And if you can't, you at least know that there are people you can ask and you know where you might go wrong so that you can get some help. Good? Good. Any questions? Comments? So you mentioned early on that the hands that are generated by a poker server look different from the hands that a live poker game mm -hmm. comes up with. How does that affect the way poker players like online poker servers versus playing with a group of buddies in a room somewhere? Yeah, I mean, the, it's interesting because there's a difference of opinion here. The, the people who run the poker servers believe that they're actually making you more popular than live games by having all these interesting hands. People like myself, and everybody I've talked to on these servers are like, yeah, this is terrible. We only play here because nobody doesn't do it somewhere else. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's, this is a question that I think deserves some actual sociological research investigation, right, of sort of what actually does make these things popular or not. It'd be fun to do some A-B testing. And I'd have to assume people did some, but I don't know. People who run poker servers don't seem to be the most savvy people on the planet, um, especially free poker servers. Now, in, like I say, in the for money community, I don't believe this is nearly as much of a problem. People accuse it of it all the time, but the other thing I told you which is true is that there's more exciting hands in from a truly randomly shuffled deck than there are from a human shuffled deck. And so I think some of that's just perception. I mean, for me to make the accusation about the free poker servers, I've sat there and taken hand statistics and gone, no, this isn't random at all. Uh, you know, we're seeing flushes on every fourth hand. That's probably not a thing. Uh, but uh, but, um, but if you're, you'd be kind of crazy really to juice hands if you're running a for money poker site. Because like I say, A, you're likely to get sued and B, somebody's likely to start playing along your distribution and clean up, you know, in a way that you really wouldn't like. Um, yeah, no. 
not. So the for paying ones seem to generate. Yeah, as far as I know, I don't like I said, I don't play poker for money on the internet. So here I'm going on secondhand reports. But yes, I, I've heard a lot less and a lot less credible accusations about those than the free ones. Um, and some like Yahoo Poker, I've never seen the hands be juiced either because no one cares, right? I mean, <laughs> no one cares if you play Yahoo Poker. But, uh, but for the ones that they're actually trying to attract an audience for their advertising, is, I haven't found a good one in, really in a long time. Yeah. This is more of just a comment, but uh, you have me thinking a lot about how uh, randomness as a, as a UX problem is a, is a very different problem than, as you, you mentioned, with the, the decks having them juice. Because it's more exciting. And the math behind that I actually find really interesting, especially for like randomness as a music player. You don't mm -hmm. necessarily want the same artist to come up multiple times in a row, so you actually want that artist to be equidistant apart from the other time. Yeah, there are all these interesting random distributions that the people who study psychology and that kind of thing like to talk about, um, 1 over F noise and brown noise and pink noise, that sort of have properties that they sort of are interesting distributions to humans, whatever that means. Um, and so if, if, for example, you're trying to generate listenable computer-generated music, then you tend to pull from distributions like that, not from uniform distributions, because uniform distributions sound random and make ugly music. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely, it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, recently, um, perhaps not even, maybe less than three months ago, I read this article um, about some folks who are trying to use uh, Google Chrome as a search engine. And they found yeah, the CCD random CCD stuff. Random. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the physical processes that generates random bits is the lower order bits of CCDs tend to be quantum noise, and so you can harvest some randomness out of that. And so if you take an, a webcam that has a, you know, 8 million little CCD pixels in it, um, you can sit there and pull the lower order bits of those pixels and use them as a source of randomness. It's not a terrible idea. There's been a million really creative, cool hardware random number generator ideas out there. For example, you can go find Lava Rand, I think it's still running, that was done by one of the old Unix guys, um, Sam Leffler, that has a web camera focused on a lava lamp, and uh, <laughs> it sits there and watches the lava lamp to generate random bits. Um, the, another one of my favorites is Hot Bits, which I think is still up and running. The guy's got a, a radioactive source and a Geiger counter in a 100-foot well, and he's got a wire running out of it with random bits that you can access over the web. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the problems with that is that, again, you know, how much is under the user's control? I think that's an interesting experimental question. If you're trying to generate random numbers for some you know, non-adversarial purpose, you're probably going to be pretty happy with those. But it would be a really interesting experiment for somebody in the hacker community to do to play with you know, how much those random low order bits are actually affectable by shining the right thing on. And if you look at, those, if you look at that generator, they're specifying really carefully what the background, what you're supposed to be pointing the camera at to get the bits. You can't just do it with the camera pointing at anything. Which should make you suspicious, right? That there's something funny going on there. Um, I suspect that one's easy to make right, but I don't think anybody's done it yet. How much uh, should we expect the pixels to be independent? Be what? Independent. Um, like I say, if you believe that, as these people do, and I, they have good reasons, that it's quantum processes down at the bottom affecting those lower order bits, then totally. <laughs> Unless the quantum state's coupled, blah, blah. I mean, physics is hard, is the, is the short version of this, right? And it's really easy to do those calculations wrong. And that's the kind of way you get your hardware random number generator screwed up. But there's at least some hope for approaches like that, because we've done similar things and made them work. I mean, it's not that different than what we're proposing to do with our little USB device, um, except that they have a million really bad random number generators, whereas we have one really better one. <laughs> so, you know, but on the other hand, theirs comes free with your phone. But on the other hand, you have to have a phone, which I'm not likely to plug into my server to generate random numbers. So, <laughs> yeah. Or a phone cam, at least, which is a $100 device, probably, if you buy it to plug into your server. Yeah. Now, I'm quite curious, like what your hardware design you're doing, is there yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's going to be some. So one of the reasons we chose the particular Zener diode we, we did is because it's actually characterized in such a way that you can tell how many random bits you can pull out of it. 
Um, it looks like it was actually characterized that way because they expected people to build, to build hardware random number generators out of it. And so that was what motivated Bdale to actually start this. He's like, oh, this diode clearly is supposed to be a hardware random number generator. Let's turn it into one. Uh, but absolutely, there's going to be some bit rate beyond which you know, things don't change over time. And so your bits, successive bits are going to be the same. And now you're going to have bad troubles for sure. Yeah. And like I say, we're relying on the manufacturer's characterization curves to some extent to show us how much bits we can pull out. And that's why we think we can get a million. <laughs> yeah. A second. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. It was big, big fun.